Just to make a very short introduction to Professor Gerardo Cadava uh, to our series on uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, Professor Cadava uh, is an associate professor, I understand, at the Department of History in uh, Northwestern University. Uh, and he's also affiliated to the Latino and um, Latina program, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Um, uh, his research, his own uh, focuses on Latinos in the US and the US-Mexican uh, borderlands. He has been awarded uh, fellowships for his book, I believe it's for Standing on Common Ground, uh, the making on a, of a Sunbelt Borderland, uh, published by Harvard University Press in 2013. He received a, a fellowship for this book from the Stanford Humanity Center, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Um, his uh, book, uh, Standing on Common Ground, uh, was about the Arizona Sonora borderlands since World War II. Uh, it won the Frederick Jackson Turner Award given annually by the Organization of American Historians. Professor Cadava, uh, most recent book, is, I believe it's out already, is it, uh, Geraldo? Uh, is uh, the Hispanic Republican the shaping of an American political identity from Nixon to Trump. Today, Professor Cadava is going to speak to us about how Latino voters decide US elections. So welcome and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, um, everyone at Washington University for welcoming me. I know that um, you know, it's the week after Thanksgiving. Our quarter is just coming to an end and it's getting darker earlier. We've been spending several months online in front of a computer. And so I know that um, your time that you're giving me for the next hour or so is no small thing because I'm sure, you know, there are many more things to do besides listen to me talk about Latino politics for the next hour. So thank you really for joining me. It's great to be here in this new Zoom world of intellectual stimulation. And I'm waving at you. You guys are, I don't know, five hours that way, I think. Um, so hello. Um, and hopefully we can all meet in person someday. So <clears throat> I, am, I am talking about how Latinos decide US elections, um, but I am going to approach that subject from a somewhat unconventional angle by talking about Latino Republicans. And, um, you know, I think we'll have plenty of time in Q&A and I'll have some thoughts about, you know, how my history that I've written connects to the recent election. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about the research I did for this book, The Hispanic Republican the shaping of an American political identity from Nixon to Trump. I mean, I think I got interested in this topic because my grandfather is a Hispanic Republican. He was born in uh, Panama, but his family is from Colombia and the Philippines. And my um, grandmother is uh, Mexican American, but from Lordsburg, New Mexico. And so for my whole childhood, I basically had arguments with my grandfather about politics and the border and immigration and welfare and kind of everything, the whole thing. My grandpa first voted for a Republican in 1980 when he voted for um, Ronald Reagan. He was a copper miner outside of Tucson, Arizona at the time and Reagan had been promising to uh, put more money into his bi-weekly paycheck through tax cuts. And so he voted for uh, Reagan for the first time for that very narrow reason, but then over the past four decades kind of embraced whole cloth, the positions of the Republican party. So part of what I was interested in is, um, you know, how individuals, political identities, 
evolve over time and you know they might join a party for a very particular purpose but over years they become more involved in the party to the point that they almost have i won't call it blind loyalty because there are still the issues that they support but they do develop a partisan loyalty and so when i talked to my grandpa a couple of weeks ago before the recent election and I asked him how he felt about Donald Trump and he just said, oh, he's he's a good guy because he's a Republican. That's all it was. It wasn't that there were any issues that he was talking about um, kind of behind his support. It was just that he was a good guy because he was a Republican. So, you know, I think that the topic that I wrote about is of course, relevant to the election that just happened. And I think there are just so many fascinating narratives about Latinos and the 2020 election, you know, coming out of the past month, you know, one has to do with this kind of um, perennial rediscovery of Latinos every four years, you know, um, parties forget about us for two or three years and then remember that we exist. And, you know, that that is often part of the problem. I mean, when we talk about Joe Biden, part of the problem was that he didn't engage early and often. And in some ways, you know, he staked his primary campaign on other voting blocks, you know, the disaffected Republicans who might have been Obama voters, but then Trump voters, but then didn't like what Trump did. So he was trying to court them or uh, black voters in the South who were really critical to his primary victory. But then, you know, that meant, of course, that he just didn't prioritize Latinos from the very beginning. So this rediscovery of Latinos every four years, that's something that's been fascinating. I think, um, you know, the, the shift toward Trump is, of course, fascinating. And the idea that this person who is, I think many of us would consider him to be um, outwardly racist and someone who puts, uh, you know, Stephen Miller in charge of the nation's immigration policies, how is it possible that this person could actually expand his support between 2016 and 2020. That's an interesting narrative in and of itself. Um, then there's the usual stories about, you know, swing voters and important battleground states, how Miami voted, how South Texas voted. I've been really interested in how um, Hispanic and Latino identity itself in some ways has been called into question as a result of this election. That's something I wasn't really expecting. I mean, in 20 12, 2016, I think there's always a tension to how Latino voters voted, but you know, I don't recall the fundamental category of Hispanic and Latino. Usually that is a kind of internal community conversation and argument. I mean, Latinos have argued for a long time what is the core of Latino identity, what is Hispanic identity anyway. Um, and usually this isn't a, a question when we Latinos have this argument, it's not a question to be resolved. It's just a kind of ongoing question. In some ways, I would say the essence of Latino identity is just an argument about what Latino identity even means. And so it was surprising to have that thing that you know I teach about in Latino history courses, Latino identity, all of a sudden be part of a national conversation. That, that was kind of curious to me. Um, so all of the things I'll talk about are of course related to the um, election and all the things I wrote about are related to the election, but I wanna tell you a little bit about my historical findings and then at the end of the talk and even more in discussion, we can talk about the present. And thank you for going down this rabbit hole with me for a while and thinking about this kind of odd research topic that I dedicated a lot of the last few years to. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna try to share with you a PowerPoint presentation just to sh show you some images here. Okay. And unfortunately I can't turn this into um, a slideshow presentation because I'm working with like a, a dual screen here. I got a monitor up there. So I think if I, pop it into um, uh, a slideshow presentation, it, it will kind of take over the whole screen. So I hope it's okay with you to just see it with these uh, thumbnail images here on the left. So first and foremost, I wanted to write a book about 
Hispanic Republicans in order to begin to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge about Latinas and Latinos in the United States. And I wanted to tackle one big idea held by the general public and even many scholars that Latinos are monolithic political actors, that we are overwhelmingly Democrats, and stated more strongly that we are natural Democrats. And I don't think that Latinos are naturally anything. I think diverse political identities are a product of history. They develop over time and you know, conversations with family and community members. There's no such thing as a, a, a natural anything. I think you know, the, the whole idea that any, anything or anyone is a product of nature is one that historians are always going to try to wrestle with and argue against. To be clear, most Hispanics, and I should just say that I'm using the term Hispanic right up front because it's the term that most conservative Latinos identify with themselves. I mean, you know, the, the name of the first official auxiliary of the Republican National Committee is the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. Um, now, you know, that's migrated a little bit and it was the Latinos for Trump campaign. And so I, I wouldn't say that Hispanic and Latino in the context of politics are synonymous. I do think they have different meanings, but they can also be interchangeable in the sense that I think conservatives, liberals can use them both. Um, so I don't, I don't mean to say they're synonymous, but they are interchangeable. But I'm gonna use Hispanics because that's the term that most of the people that I'm talking about, especially in this historical moment in the 60s, 70s and 80s most identified with. So to be clear, most Hispanics do vote for Democrats. About two thirds of them, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, have voted for the Democratic presidential candidate since the days of Richard Nixon in the late 60s and early 70s. But this also means that one third of Hispanics who amount to millions of voters every election have been ignored. Media coverage, I think, hasn't really helped us understand these voters. Uh, we have a a nine month old Australian shepherd. So she, if you hear barking, there's just a lot of <clears throat> activity upstairs. So hopefully it's not too distracting for you guys or for me for that matter. Um, so I'm talking about the one third of Hispanics who amount to millions of voters every election who often get ignored. And I think that media coverage hasn't helped us understand these voters. After elections, articles often report that the Democrat uh, crushed the Republican or that they won in a landslide, but then they leave it in that. There's leave it at that. There's much more attention paid to the, uh, for good reason, to the super majority of Latinos who vote for Democrats. To the extent that media does try to explain Latino support for Republican, Republicans, they usually focus on uh, particular issues like abortion or Catholicism or military service, wealth, even skin color or age cohort. Political scientists, I think, also haven't really helped us understand Hispanic Republicans. They acknowledge that some Hispanics and Latinos are Republicans, but they too have focused on the, you know, two thirds of Hispanics or Latinos who are liberal with the result that they too ignore uh, millions who are conservative. And they argue that liberalism is a core part of Latino identity based on attitude surveys that find that a majority of Hispanics or Latinos support government intervention in the economy or that they favor comprehensive immigration reform, including a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants usually the one finding that lends credence to the idea that Hispanics are conservative, they say, is the aversion to welfare and other so-called entitlement programs. And we know that resonates with all kinds of narratives about pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, living the American dream, self-improvement, all of those things. And I think that by focusing on particular issues like Catholicism, like abortion, like military service. I think that this misses a bigger picture. 
I don't think that there is a single issue or national group that can explain why Hispanics have identified as Republicans. I think that these attitude surveys, which find that a certain percentage of Hispanics support X, while a certain percentage supports Y, and then go on to infer that Hispanics are conservative or liberal based on such findings can be misleading. So to take just one example, I think that religion cuts in many different directions. Certain aspects of the Catholic tradition can be seen as conservative, while others can be seen as liberal, including a strong Latin American tradition of liberation theology. Moreover, while there is still a greater number of Hispanics who are Catholic, the fastest growing religion among them is evangelical Christianity. And evangelicals themselves aren't monolithically conservative. It's a faith that many immigrants practiced in Latin America then brought with them to the United States. <clears throat> and usually the Latino evangelical vote gets split between Republicans and Democrats. But it's certainly the case that more Latino evangelicals vote for Republicans than the national Latino population in general. That's what makes evangelicals uh, kind of evangelical churches a kind of fertile ground for recruitment by Republicans. So religion is complicated um, and you also can't chalk up their partisan identity just to an issue like Catholicism. And I'm really kind of focusing on the issues here just to poke holes in them that people always responded to me with when I told them I was writing my book. When I told them I was writing about Hispanic Republicans, the first thing people would always say like, oh, you must be writing about Catholics. It has a lot to do with their Catholicism or, oh, you must be writing about the Cuban exile community because it's all about anti-Castro activism. It's all about South Florida. So I think that's why I'm trying to focus on these issues here to kind of poke some holes in the big ideas that people have about Latino conservatives. And I don't think you can chalk up conservatism to national background either. It's long been assumed that Cubans are the Hispanic Republicans par excellence. And when I interviewed many of the California based Mexican Americans who were active in Republican party politics in the 1960s, they bristled at this idea that it was all about the Cubans. One Mexican American told me that Cuban Americans quote, didn't really matter until 1980 when Ronald Reagan brought them into the conservative movement. Before 1980, many Cubans were still focused on overthrowing Castro, returning to the island, and as a result, didn't naturalize. And most who naturalized and voted were as likely to support Democrats as Republicans. Carter, Jimmy Carter, for example, won a majority of the Cuban American vote in 1976. And that only shifted in 1980 with Reagan and even more so with the establishment by Jorge Mascanosa of the Cuban American National Foundation in 1981. So again, it wasn't only Cubans, it was also, and in many ways, primarily Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans who launched and grew the Republican, Hispanic Republican movement. The other thing that I think journalists and political science scientists miss is how partisan loyalty to the Republican Party has developed over the past two generations from the 1950s forward. And I think this is the big picture that I'm trying to bring into view by moving away from a focus on particular moments like the Cuban Revolution or particular national groups and particular issues. And so I try to do this in my book in four parts. Here is a picture of the cover of my book. This image behind the American flag is of a gathering of um, Hispanic Republicans in 1983 at a Reagan um, speech. And I have four parts. The first one is called Awakening. It's about this period when Hispanics begin moving toward the Republican party. The second part is, it's actually called inclusion. I think, I don't know why I wrote influence here, just, just a typo. So the second part is inclusion. And this is about the time when Richard Nixon in particular made a greater effort than any Republican before him to include Hispanics 
The third part is called doubt. And it's about when Hispanics were simultaneously more included in politics than ever before, but when they also began to doubt whether either party was truly committed to their full incorporation. And then the fourth part is called loyalty. And this is about when Hispanic Republicans were dismayed with the party's rightward turn on immigration and failure to achieve other goals, but they never abandoned the party. And I think in some ways we're still in this moment of loyalty today. We can talk more about that in the Q&A. So I begin my book in the 1950s. Dwight Eisenhower was, he was really the first Republican president that Hispanic, uh, Hispanics rallied around. And it didn't start, I wanna be clear about this, it didn't start as a national movement, but it was the result of efforts of particular activists in the Southwest, especially in California. And Hispanics became more politically active as a result of their participation in World War II. As many scholars have noted, veterans and others began to demand individual and collective rights. And veterans in particular identified with Eisenhower because they saw him as their general. He was the military leader that most helped the United States win World War II and with the post-war reconstruction efforts in Europe. So he, many Hispanics believed, would be the Cold War leader that the country needed. But as much as Hispanics began to move toward the Republican Party, the party and both parties actually, the Democrats and Republicans also began to move toward them. And I think this happened in the 1950s for two reasons. First, as the population of the Sun Belt exploded after World War II from the Southeast, like Florida, to the Southwest, like Arizona, elsewhere, so did politicians' attention to the Sun Belt. In 1950, New York still had the largest number of electoral votes. But as the populations of states like California and Texas and Florida grew, they achieved greater electoral importance. And these were also the states that had the largest Hispanic populations in the country. The other reason is that as the Cold War in the Americas heated up in Puerto Rico and Mexico and Guatemala and Uruguay and Cuba and elsewhere, politicians began to see Hispanics as important brokers who through their business and political connections in Latin America could help the United States achieve its foreign policy objectives in the region. After they supported Eisenhower, Hispanic Republicans supported Barry Goldwater during his 1964 campaign. This is um, Robert Benitez Robles in Arizona. He was an insurance salesman for New York Life uh, from Yuma, Arizona in the southwestern corner of the state. And he was the head of Barry Goldwater's um, Hispanics or Latinos con Goldwater organization in Arizona. So among other issues, Goldwater harped on the Kennedy administration's failure at the Bay of Pigs, which marked the very beginning of a long turning away of Cubans from the Democratic Party. And Cubans at first liked Kennedy, but then came to see him as a traitor after he refused to send military backup to the Cuban exiles who led the 1961 invasion. And seizing on the opportunity afforded by their criticism, Goldwater began to make inroads with Cubans in Florida and all along the Eastern seaboard. He also drew support from Mexican Americans in the Southwest, especially Arizona and California. But again, to be clear, Eisenhower's eight years in office and Goldwater's failed campaign in 1964, these were very early moments in the mutual embrace between Hispanics and the Republican Party. The Hispanic Republican movement began in earnest during Richard Nixon's first term in office. Before then, Republican presidential candidates won single digit support from Hispanics. And this changed dramatically in 1972 when Nixon won approximately a third of the Hispanic vote. And he was the first Republican to do so, but he set the bar for all Republicans after him. As historians who've written about the first Nixon administration have made clear, Nixon's 
first term in office wasn't going well. There was the war in Vietnam, campus protests, prison riots. So Nixon set out to both undermine his enemies and recruit new supporters. The former effort to undermine his enemies, of course, led to the Watergate. The latter effort to recruit new supporters led him to recruit Hispanic voters. At the same time, Republican strategists were realizing that the party needed Hispanics because Black voters were leaving the party. They were very explicit about this. Nixon recruited Hispanics by establishing the Cabinet Committee on Opportunities for Spanish-speaking Peoples. This gathered the heads of the agencies that dealt most with the so-called Hispanic issues like labor, agriculture, health, education, and welfare to focus attention primarily on increasing federal employment opportunities for Hispanics. And this led some Hispanic Republicans to oppose Nixon because instead of seeing him as a true conservative, they saw him as the father of the quota system, anticipating the language about affirmative action. And this is what Linda Chavez, one prominent Hispanic Republican has called him. Nixon also sought Hispanic support by making several high level appointments, including Romana Costa Banuelos as the first Hispanic treasurer of the United States. Here she is in the Oval Office on the day of her nomination in September 1971. She is one of the more fascinating characters I came across. She owned a tortilla factory in East Los Angeles. It became uh, Ramona's Mexican food products. Her name is Romana, but she called the company Ramona because uh, the idea was that white people would have a hard time pronouncing the name Romana. So she went with a much easier Ramona. Um, there's also you know, a famous novel uh, called Ramona in California. So the name Ramona in California has all kinds of historical echoes. And um, she started banks in East Los Angeles, like the Banco del Pueblo, the Pan American National Bank that served primarily Mexican American customers because they were shut out uh, from you know, banking and getting loans from much larger banks like Wells Fargo and others. So she's a super interesting character. She became the first Hispanic treasurer of the United States. Nixon also appointed others like Hilario Sandoval as the head of the Small Business Administration, uh, Benjamin Fernandez as the head of the National Economic Development Agency, and many, many others. I also find it interesting that, you know, Banuelos' appointment as the first Hispanic treasurer of the United States, it also marked the beginning of the Republican Party's tradition of appointing female Hispanics to the post, which continues today. There was Catherine Ortega under Reagan, Catalina Vasquez Vialpando under George H.W. Bush, Rosario Marin under George W. Bush, Jovita, well, Jovita Carranza is not the treasurer. She's the administrator of the um, Small Business Administration, but there's a long history of appointing Hispanic women to posts in administrations, Republican administrations, to posts that have to do with um, economics and business. And we can talk a lot. I could talk forever about, you know, the symbolism of these appointments and what they did. Basically, though, the idea behind these appointees was that they signaled to Hispanics across the country that the Nixon administration cared about them and they could become key surrogates for Nixon on the campaign trail. And this is exactly what they did. And they received lots of credit after Nixon's landslide reelection. For the rest of the 70s, Republicans tried to duplicate Nixon's success among Hispanics, and they started to build out the party infrastructure, especially with the establishment of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly in 1974. This became a, a, the official auxiliary of the Republican National Committee, which at the time was headed by George H.W. Bush. And the first national chairman of the RNHA, as the group became known, was Ben Fernandez, who served in the Nixon administration. And the group, the RNHA, really became a kind of power broker for Hispanic Republican politics. Gerald Ford courted their endorsement in 1976, and the organization really became a bullpen for 
future Republican appointees, all of these Hispanic treasurers I had just told you about, they were all leaders of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly before Republican presidents kind of tapped them to uh, occupy posts in their administration. Ford himself didn't do very well among Hispanics and he lost the election to Carter, but his administration had still some key legacies for the Hispanic Republican movement, including recognition of the RNHA as a key influencer of Hispanics. And the appointment of the first special assistant to the president of the United States for Hispanic affairs. This was the New Mexican uh, Fernando de Baca. Fernando de Baca, I don't know if you guys remember this, but 12 years ago got a little, uh, got, got into some trouble when he moved back to New Mexico. He worked for the state Republican party. And in 2008, he had to resign from that post because he said that Latinos wouldn't or Hispanic wouldn't vote for a black president in 2008. And so, you know, that leads to all kinds of other fascinating questions about Latino Republicans and race and identity politics. Ford was also responsible for signing the 1975 amendment to the Voting Rights Act, which mandated the publication of election materials in Spanish as well as English in communities with significant Hispanic populations. It increased Hispanic political participation and was championed by a Republican president. Another fascinating incident uh, was this moment in 1976 when Gerald Ford was um, beginning all of the bicentennial celebrations of the 200th anniversary of the United States. And he traveled, so he traveled to a lot of American cities to mark the bicentennial. This picture was taken at the Alamo in San Antonio in April, um, in April of 1976. And a photographer for the San Antonio Express captured him biting into a tamal that he hadn't taken the corn shuck off of. And the article described him as kind of biting uncomfortably into uh, the tamal and, you know, all, all kinds of political symbolism were at work here. I mean, many took it as a sign of Ford's cultural insensitivity toward Mexican-Americans. Ford had just lost in the Texas primary to Ronald Reagan. So he was already going into the general election kind of weakened and Ford lost in Texas in the general election to Jimmy Carter by a couple hundred thousand votes. And so Hispanic Republicans afterwards called it, you know, the great disaster of 1976, because if Gerald Ford had only won Texas, he would have won the election. If he hadn't bitten into a tamal without taking the corn off, he would have won Texas. So you could see, I, I know the title of the talk was how Hispanics decide elections. You know, one of the ways they decide elections is by staying home and not voting for the candidate who bites into tamales without taking the corn off first. So this is this is kind of a joke, but I, I mean, of course, like Ford was already, you know, Texas was not a strong point for him because, you know, Texan Republicans were much more excited about Ronald Reagan at the time. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Oh, where does the time go? It's already 640. I wanna tell you just a couple more things before we um, talk. So I wanna kind of definitely get through the 80s and then I think I can summarize a lot of uh, what's going on from the 90s to the present because I kind of see the past 25, 30 years as part of, part of this kind of single period in Hispanic Republican politics. But there's a lot really interesting that's going on in the late 1970s. The other thing that happens is a guy named Benjamin Fernandez, Boxcar Ben, becomes the first Hispanic to run for president. He was in the Nixon administration. He uh, was the national chairman of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. His nickname was Benjamin Boxcar Ben because he was born in 1925 in a railroad boxcar. His parents were immigrants and uh, they worked in agriculture. He worked in agriculture as a child, worked in Midwestern fields and ultimately settled in East Chicago, Indiana. Then he goes on to um, 
graduate from the University of the Redlands in California, gets a business degree at NYU, becomes an economist, works for Nixon, works for Ford, works for the RNHA. Then he declares himself to be a, a candidate for president. And, you know, in the same month that he declared his candidacy, Time Magazine published this kind of famous cover story um, that said that the 1980s was gonna be the decade of the Hispanic. So it signaled a lot of like momentum for Hispanic Americans because the population was growing. They were more included in politics. And this is the momentum that Ben Fernandez was trying to, see, to seize. He made these arguments that the nation, not only was the nation ready for its first Latino president, but it needed a Hispanic president because they needed someone who spoke Spanish uh, because Jimmy Carter had made a mess of US Latin American relations with the start of the civil war in Nicaragua. He, they also needed an economist because Jimmy Carter had made a mess of the economy. And they also needed a Hispanic because Hispanics were you know, one of the fastest growing populations in the country. Here's a picture of uh, Ben Fernandez with his wife, Jackie Fernandez. This is actually in a, a ice cream shop in Santiago, Chile, because one of the things that Fernandez did right before he announced his candidacy, he kind of took a tour throughout Latin America to establish his credentials as an expert on US Latin American relations. And he stayed at Anastasio Somoza's house. Somoza kind of rolled out a big uh, party for him. Um, this picture was taken by a guy named Jeff Widener, who at the time, was just a kid. He was like in his early 20s, just starting his career as a photographer. About 12 years later in 1989, he became the photographer who took that famous picture in Tiananmen Square called Tank Man with the guy standing in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square. I think it might have won a major, maybe even a Pulitzer or something, like some major award for photography. But I love that you know, 12 years before he was in Tiananmen Square, this young photographer goes, you know, to Latin America with Ben Fernandez, the first Latino candidate for president. Um, ben Fernandez lost badly, very, very badly in the 1980 primary. He lost to Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush. Um, and his whole electoral theory was crazy. He was going to focus on the first ever Puerto Rican primary. Uh, this is the first time there was a Republican Party primary in Puerto Rico. And um, he was going to focus there and kind of win the support of his co-ethnic other Latinos. And he was going to skip out on the New Hampshire and Iowa primaries, uh, which was the much more traditional path. And his idea was that if he could win the Puerto Rico primary, people on the mainland would take notice and say, like, who is this Hispanic who just won the Puerto Rican primary? But he didn't even come in you know, first, second, or third. Uh, first was George H.W. Bush, who won 60% of the primary, largely because of his 27-year-old son, Jeb Bush, who basically camped out in San Juan, Puerto Rico for about four months before the primary to try to build up support for his father. And here is Jeb Bush's wife, Columba Garnica de Gallo. She's a naturalized Mexican immigrant and um, you know, their sons are the little brown ones. I don't know if you guys remember that uh, episode in 1989 at the Republican National Convention, but George H.W. called his, his half Mexican grandkids the little, little brown ones. And this is Julia Rivera de Vicente. She's one of the, um, she's one of the uh, kind of main movers and shakers in uh, Puerto Rican politics. So this is actually the, the only reason I wanted to show this picture is that this is kind of the beginning of the Bush dynasty when it comes to Hispanic outreach and support. And it goes to show that like someone like George W. Bush, who, you know, became famous for his Latino outreach, he was also really relying on his family's like long standing efforts to cultivate relationships with Latino communities. Okay. I'm gonna start rushing just a little bit because I do wanna to talk to you guys. And so I wanna say one thing about Reagan and well, I wanna talk about Reagan, I'll say a couple things about Reagan. And then I wanna talk about this period from the nineties forward. So the way that Reagan really changed things up with recruiting Latinos is that he moved away from 
the kind of patronage politics embodied by people like uh, Richard Nixon, remember like all these appointments and creation of government agencies and federal jobs to cater to Latinos. And Reagan wasn't going to appeal to particular blocks of voters, particular ethnic groups. Instead, he crafted a much more ideologically conservative appeal. And it was his Hispanic campaign advisors who really encouraged him to articulate what the core characteristics of Latino conservatism were. So they named like family values, work ethic, patriotism, anti-communism, all of these things that in many ways still 40 years later form the core of the Hispan of the Republican Party's playbook when it comes to recruiting um, recruiting Latinos. And so the important thing is that it was a shift away from patronage politics toward a much more ideological appeal. And there's just so much going on in the Reagan era. It's hard to summarize, but again, it's the period when Cubans come more into the fold. The big naturalization drives for Cubans when Cubans kind of abandon the idea that they're about to retake Cuba and oust Castro, that happens in the mid 1970s. And that's when thousands and tens of thousands of Cubans naturalize in Florida and start participating more in American electoral politics. Reagan is also, you know, he's, He's a president who, you know, said to Jose Lopez Portillo that we don't need a nine foot fence dividing our two countries. Um, he passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which granted amnesty to two million Mexicans. So he's a far cry from someone like Donald Trump, even though Trump has been compared to Reagan for his embrace of conservative ideology. And many Latino Republicans today will tell you that the reason Trump did so well is he truly articulated a conservative message to Latinos. So they compare him to Reagan in that regard. Um, and then of course, Reagan, you know, got involved in the Contra war and the Iran Contra affair. And to many Hispanic Republicans, this was not like a blemish on the Reagan years because they supported um, American intervention in Central America and they were as anti-communist as Reagan was. So there's a lot happening. Um, and many Hispanic Republicans really felt like they were included during the Reagan years. They had a seat at the table of decision-making and things like that. But at the same time, the Republican party is changing because beginning in the late 1970s with the rise of groups like the Federation for American Immigration Reform, this kind of anti-immigration group or the formation of a group called US English, which tries to pass a constitutional amendment to make English the official language of the United States you see the rise of a kind of nativism and xenophobia within the Republican Party. And I think this is embodied by uh, primary challengers like Patrick Buchanan, who runs against George H.W. Bush in 1992 and wins, you know, 37% of the um, Republican primary votes. And so his rise in the 1990s is kind of representative of a movement by the Republican Party far to the right on immigration and border issues. And in many ways, I think the Republican Party is still kind of in the moment it was in in the early 1990s with its move to the right on immigration and border policy. And seen in that context, you know, with like Proposition 187, the restrictive 1996 immigration bill, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, um, you know, seen in that context, that much broader sweep of the past two and a half, three decades, the George W. Bush administration, which was seen as much more, you know, tolerant and wanted to pass comprehensive immigration reform. It's really the Bush years that were the exception, a kind of eight year blip um, on the radar screen of this much longer shift toward more restrictive border controls, anti-immigrant positions. And I think that um, you know, during the Bush years, many Latino Republicans wanted to see Bush as representative of the future of the Republican Party. Um, and for a long time, you know, the, the key to recruiting Latinos for Republicans, because of George W. Bush's success, he won 
40, 44% of the Latino vote, which was the most, still is the most that any Republican candidate had ever won. Um, but because of that, you know, the theory was that the best way for a Republican candidate to reach out to Latinos was by articulating support for comprehensive immigration reform. And interestingly, this is one of the many ways in which it's deeply ironic that someone like Trump could actually expand his support because he did the exact opposite of what consultants, political anal analysts said a Republican had to do in order to win Latino support. And that's why even many of the conservative Latinos who worked in the George W. Bush administration, they'll call George W. Bush's brand of conservatism Republican light, L-I-T-E, because he wasn't a true conservative like uh, he didn't embrace a truly conservative agenda in the same way that Trump did. And so many Latino Republicans today will argue that Trump is charting in some ways like a new course for uh, Latino conservatism because he's fully embraced this kind of working class party idea. Uh, you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you saw like after, um, after, the election, Marco Rubio started tweeting about how, you know, what you saw happen in South Florida and South Texas is just a glimpse at the future of the Republican Party um, because it's going to be a party for non white working class Americans. And it's hard to imagine that realignment happening. And if it did, of course, it would not be good for Democrats. And I guess I kind of see the next four years in some ways you know, both parties battling over, um, you know, working class voters and both parties kind of claiming to be the representatives of working class voters. But um, the important thing I wanted to say about the period from the 90s forward is that, you know, Hispanic Republicans, there was always this question, like, when is, when is the moment going to come that Hispanic Republicans are going to abandon the Republican Party in the same way that African Americans did in the 1960s. And many thought that episodes like Proposition 187 or, um, you know, the renewal of anti-immigrant legislation after 9-11, that those kinds of moments were going to signal a turning away from the Republican Party by Latinos. And it hasn't happened. I mean, it's, it's kind of remarkable the consistency with which somewhere between a quarter and a third of Latinos will vote for the Republican Party, even as the Republican Party changes in all sorts of ways. And now, this year, it's not even that Latinos didn't abandon the Republican Party, but there was a shift toward the Republican Party. And so um, I think the important thing is that, yes, in this era when the Republican Party has moved further to the right on immigration and border issues, Hispanic Republicans in many ways are at greater pains to continue to justify their support for the Republican Party, but they do so by pointing to other issues like health care, education, um, the economy as things they care about more than immigration. And they have versions of the story of um, immigration and, and how Democrats misunderstand immigrants that really run counter to a lot of um, what we consider to be common sense. So um, I will end there just because we only have 20 minutes now and the problem with professors is you just put a nickel in us and we won't shut up. So I could go on, but I will not. And um, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you guys about anything from the history to this election to the future, anything you guys want to talk about. Very good. Thank you, uh, Geraldo. Yeah. Any questions, any comments from the audience? This is the time. Yeah. I have a comment. Uh, ¿Puedo hacer un comentario? ¿Me puedes oír? Yeah, so I was thinking back to what you were saying about the at the beginning about the intersection of politics and religion and how you would get this question of like, oh, is you know the Hispanic Republicans, is it because of Catholicism? 
And I'm wondering if maybe you already did this in your book or in your work, but if you think it's helpful to analytically distinguish between American Catholicism, which is a very white, you know, and they go towards uh, the Republicans for issues that we already know, and then Latino Catholicism, which a lot of them vote Democrat, even if they are Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking particularly of South Florida, not Cubans, but all the other nationalities. And so they seem to be very like not single single issue voters, right? They care about things like immigration and, and um, education, health reform and so on. So I don't know if that's a helpful or if you feel like that may be, may be one of the issues at work, like having this monolithic idea of Catholicism when it, it actually is very different if it's Latino Catholicism versus American Catholicism. I think that's a great observation. I mean, yeah, Catholics themselves are very diverse and depending on what traditions they were raised in, believe different things. And yeah, for sure. I think that's a really important point. I think also, um, you know, it's just hard to say in terms of how, I mean, some people will still just tell you that um, the only issue I care about is abortion. And as long as a democratic candidate supports abortion, I'm out, you know, but I think, I think that that group of Catholics who are single issue voters are a fairly small slice of the Latino electorate that cares about Catholicism and Catholicism is somewhere in the constellation of issues that they base their decisions on. But, you know, it's less clear to me if when they go into ballot boxes, the thing that's on their mind is faith or free enterprise or socialism and anti-communism. I mean, I see it more, that's why I don't like, I don't like these attitude surveys that try to pin it on any single issue mm -hmm. in part because I think if you try, I think the whole endeavor of trying to point to a single issue is just another way really of trying, for people trying to put Latinos into a box and understand us and say, okay, now I get what it's all about. It's about Catholicism. Now I can put you Latinos on my shelf of understanding. And once I put you on my shelf, I don't have to think about you anymore, you know? And so they just say like, oh, it's Catholicism. And then once they think they understand that, they can dismiss it, you know? Um, and it's just, so it's just another one of the ways that Latinos kind of get tucked away in a corner. But I think, yeah, of course, like the pro what you're pointing to is messiness and, messiness is of course true but doesn't always lend itself to neat political narratives you know right that makes sense yeah anybody else matt yeah th thank you so much for your for your presentation i i just want to say that i really appreciated the point about sort of um the, the sort of groupism by which America, like it, it, people in the U.S., tend to understand electoral politics. It's, um, yeah. you know, it just seems like you can you can only subdivide groups in, into like so many categories of you know Latinx Catholic, Latinx Evangelical. Yeah. At, at at a certain point, you need to develop a more three dimensional understanding of social organization and coalition building and things like that. That um, I think you're really getting at here. The, the, the question I had, though, was um, I, I, to me, it seems like the, the 80s are such a, um, a rupture in the U.S. sort of dichotomy between conservative and liberal and the way we kind of use and misuse those words doesn't <laughs> sometimes seem that helpful because, um, you know, you have you have figures like Nixon who like proclaimed that uh, in like 1970 that we're all Keynesians now, right? right. Which you could never imagine um, President right. No Malarkey Biden like saying <laughs> anytime soon. Yeah. So um, I, I, I wanted to ask the question of just to, to what degree do you think that there is, um, I mean, you focused on the building of co conservative coalitions, but to what degree do you think there's a, a push factor in the just the utter failure of the Democratic Party to articulate any sort of um, working class program. <laughs> I think there's a lot there, man. Yeah, there's a lot there. And uh, yeah, the way that that intersects with outreach to Latinos, I mean, that's interesting. But yeah, I mean, you could boil it down to the differences between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, not just on their um, you know, Latino outreach, but their different 
economic platforms for sure. And definitely, I mean, the, the Democratic Party, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Lily Geismer as a historian at, um, where does she teach? Claremont McKenna, I think. And she does great work on this stuff. She has a good article in the Jacobin called Atari Democrats. And it's kind of about how in the 80s, um, you know, the Democratic Party abandons its kind of identity as representative of the working class and gets on board with like the highly educated um, engineers of Silicon Valley and how, you know, now the Democratic Party is still this kind of like Frankenstein of, um, you know, the Silicon Valley elites and the multiracial working class. And that's not necessarily a, a comfortable or easy fit. So yeah, I think there's a lot to it. And, um, you know, I, I just, this is, I, I do feel about this moment that this is probably a moment of political realignment in ways that we don't quite understand. And I do think there's something to the idea. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which I don't like the way that the Republican party and Latino Republicans in particular are characterizing their success among the working class. So for example, they talk about, you know, the ingrained cultural conservatism of the working class. And I don't think that the working class is by definition culturally conservative. Maybe there are some who are, but there are many who aren't. And, um, you know, I think it's just still ironic that the Republican Party is somehow thinking that they are going to reject the globalists in their party, the free traders in their party, and all of a sudden become representative of the working class when, you know, it's weird. It's part of it is just embodied in this odd characterization of Trump as the working class billionaire. I mean, it, it's just such a weird juxtaposition. And, you know, he is a billionaire. He, his tax cuts benefit the wealthy, those kinds of things. But I do, that's why I do think, it, it reminds me too that um, I interviewed a progressive pollster named Carlos Odio who works for Equis Research um, in Miami. And I like them a lot. I probably like them more than the Latino decisions people in Los Angeles. And he told me that what he really hopes for after the 2020 election is uh, uh, the white working class treatment for Latinos. And what he meant by that, he said he didn't, we don't want a, a hillbilly elegy for Latinos. That's not what we're looking for. But the idea was that after 2016, when Democrats realized that they'd lost white suburban voters and uh, some white working class voters, Democrats freaked out and tried to, I mean, the whole theory of Joe Biden's candidacy was he would bring back into the party some of these lost white working class voters. And, um, and so what he meant was that when he hopes that Latinos get the white working class treatment over the next four years that, you know, hopefully parties will start to take Latinos seriously as political actors. To your first point about, um, you know, groups and stuff. This is something I've been thinking a lot about. And the cleanest way I can state it, I think, is that, um, you know, I think, I don't think it makes sense to talk about the Latino vote just because, but, but just because there's no single Latino vote, it doesn't mean that there aren't 20 million Latinos who vote. And we should try to understand what they believe politically as one of 20 million Americans who cast votes. Um, the, the whole like identity thing is so interesting. And I, I, you'll see people, a, a, an editor I've worked with a lot named Isvette Verde wrote an op-ed in the Times a couple of days after the election saying that we should just retire terms like Hispanic and Latino, just get rid of them, just call us Americans. And that made, that made me a little uncomfortable because I hear that as the kind of conservative version of identity politics because Latino Republicans for a long time have always said, don't call me a hyphenated American. Call, I don't wanna be a Mexican American or a Cuban American. I wanna be an American of Mexican descent. I wanna be an American of Cuban descent. So that makes me uncomfortable. I understand why we should challenge the idea of the Latino vote or any kind of singular identity for Latinos. But, you know, there's also the democratic counter argument that we are a block that believes similar things about immigration, the environment, whatever. And that actually has practical consequences like on Capitol Hill, when you're making arguments about what the democratic party should stand for. And 
you know, a lot of the people that I've talked to, Democrats that I've talked to, what they're afraid about after this election is that the Democratic Party is going to take from it the lesson that, well, if Latinos aren't reliable voters and vote for Republicans, then why the hell are we investing in them anyway? You know, or why if, if Latinos don't prioritize immigration reform, why should we care about immigration reform? And so that's the purpose of like thinking of Latinos as a block. It's about like strength in numbers and power. And so it's just this really interesting moment when there's this kind of intellectual debate about what Hispanic and Latino identity is, but also that debate has kind of practical consequences for how the parties approach Latinos. Um, that wasn't exactly the question you answered. I was just thinking about things you had said in the beginning of your question. So I started monologuing again, sorry, but anyone else? That's great, thank you. Okay. We still have time, so any other questions? Actually, one last one, Geraldo. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if we could solve, you know, because that's what's closer to me, we could solve the, by the Rio Grande Valley. Mm. Uh, sort of the Mexican American community, because one thing that I perceive both in Mexico and here is that a, a big factor of the flip towards the Republican Party was not only Bush and his commitment to immigration reform. A, even we know from Jorge Castaneda's book that before 9-11, that was gonna be his signature policy. Yeah. Without 9-11, we might have actually have had another amnesty yeah. a, and immigration reform. Mm -hmm. But also in Mexico, generally, it's perceived that Obama was a terrible president for Mexico and for Central America. Um, he mm. deported a lot of people, um, you know, uh, supported Calderón and the war on, on drugs very strongly and very aggressively. Plan Merida was on the table. They did the Fast and the Furious, right? The caravan, the, the way the caravans in Central America were dumped. Yeah. So for me, it makes complete sense that people who live in the border and who are ideologically borderline and are not necessarily worried about immigration reform would flip out of the of the Democratic totally. Party. So I was wondering if you could address sort of the role that the Obama administration and you know Biden might predictably get into that direction too and and the Rio Grande Valley and your reading of the Rio Grande Valley. I love that man. That is so great. And I wish you know, I, that's that's a take on what happened in the Rio Grande Valley that I have not read in the past year or in the past couple of months, you know, or week or month. What is it? A month? A month. Who knows anymore? I, I don't even know where I am. So, you know, that is a great take. You know, you'll hear things instead about like how the parties have ignored the Rio Grande Valley. This is like a marginalized community. Um, you'll hear things about like the oil industry and how Joe Biden's comments about, uh, you know, banning fossil fuels or whatever alienated a lot of people in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you'll hear a lot about the Trump trains, caravans, but you know, as especially as a historian, I'm interested in this kind of longer view you give about a reaction to Obama's policies. And, you know, um, I guess the closest thing I've heard to that is the stuff about the caravans where you know, the caravans and the migrant detention and family separation things in the Rio Grande Valley, because that happened, I mean, the, the ground zero of a lot of that was in Edinburgh in South Texas. And, um, you know, so, you know, the, talking to like Hispanic Republican candidates for Congress, these are things they talked a lot about this, the kind of rise of the Rio Grande Valley is like the epicenter of the caravans and stuff like that as the reason. I, I didn't even hear them though tie that to um, frustration with Obama era policies. So I think that's fascinating, man. And I wonder also if you don't mind talking for just a minute, do you think that also ties, I mean, frustration with Obama era policies also ties to, you know, this strange bromance between AMLO and Trump? Yeah, I think that uh, Lopez Obrador thinks that Biden would actually undermine him because mm -hmm. the, the relationship with Mexico and Obama was very close to El Pan and the and El Pri. Uh -huh. And that has historical reasons of being. So Lopez Obrador is very chained to he has I don't think he has he's yet to recognize that Trump, that Biden won. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, I know, I know. They are very unfounded about it. I don't know that that's a majority. Um, in, uh, that's a majority opinion in Mexico, but Lopez Obrador is very popular with Mexican Americans in Texas. Uh, hmm. I, I think that there might be something going on in there. I don't know what's the cause and the effects of Lopez Obrador supporting to get that uh, expatriate voting part and the people who return to vote or yeah. people following Lopez Obrador in, in mm -hmm. supporting Trump. But a lot of the, and, and the, the analysts in Mexico are completely dumbfounded about yeah. Lopez Obrador's attitude towards Trump. But they actually, I think they were waiting that Trump was going to win. And I think they, they were not upset that Hillary Clinton lost either. Wow. You know, part of just to take one step back, I mean, part of what I find so interesting about this is this kind of ties very closely to my interests about kind of transnational relationships between the United States and Mexico. I mean, I think I, another question I would get asked all the time while writing this book was just, well, you know, what what's Hispanic about Hispanic conservatism? Like, is are Hispanics just like all other American conservatives? And there's something to that. I mean, if you take the Rio Grande Valley, like a lot of people have said, like, you know, the Rio Grande Valley, there's actually a lot of similarities between the Rio Grande Valley and like rural Nebraska or rural Iowa, where Mexican Americans in the Rio Grande Valley aren't, <clears throat> you know, they don't see themselves as a minority marginalized population in the same way, because they represent like 90% of the population. Um, so that's interesting and all, but I love that you're pointing to these transnational relationships, the support for AMLO in the Rio Grande Valley, because, you know, this is one of the things that always caught my attention when I would, when I was doing research in the Pan Archives, for example, in Colonia del Valle in Mexico City, they, you know, um, I would come across these things where, you know, representatives of the Pan traveled to um, the 1980, 1984, and 88 Republican National Conventions as guests of Bush and Reagan, and they would get T taken around Dallas, for example, by um, Hispanic Republicans, um, some of the people that I researched. And, you know, the idea was that why were pan panistas invited to Republican conventions? Because they were considered to be by Republicans in the United States, the Republican Party of Mexico. But that's so interesting, because in, Me in Mexico, the pan is not I don't think they would even call themselves necessarily the conservative party. I mean, they see themselves as the kind of loyal opposition to the PRI or something like that, the, pe the, the group that was kind of challenging Mexico's one party rule. So I, I guess I say all of this just in order to make a, 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 an appeal, a call for more political histories of the United States that try to compare politics in the United States with politics in Mexico or Puerto Rico or Venezuela. And, you know, one of the projects I have in mind too, not necessarily for me, but I think would be interesting is just how exactly political identity gets translated from Latin America to the United States, because we know a lot of things about Latin American immigrants, but we know a lot about them as laborers, for example, but we don't think about immigrants as serious political actors who have you know, political identities in Latin America, and then how is it when they move to the United States that they begin to think of themselves as political actors in the United States? And how how does a former member of PRI or PAN or the PNP in uh, Puerto Rico or the PEEP in Puerto Rico, whatever, come to identify as a Republican or a Democrat in the United States? And that kind of translation of political identity between the United States and Latin America would be really interesting. And I don't know that we know a whole lot about that. So that's part of why I really like the way that you're thinking about the Rio Grande Valley, because I honestly, I mean, I just haven't, you should write something about this because I just like in all of the post-election analyses, I do agree that South Texas is one of the more interesting stories about this election. It's really interesting, the fact that that happened, but um, all of the analyses of it have kind of focused squarely on U.S. domestic politics, abandonment by the Democratic Party. But so all of this stuff about Mexico is really interesting. Very good. Uh, anybody else? Probably not. So, Geraldo, we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you. very much.
Well, it was great to be here. And I hope to have the chance to interact with you all in person. I mean, one of the things that I really miss about going to the going to visit universities is the opportunity to meet everyone and hear more about your guys' work. And it's weird just kind of talking into a screen and not being to learn anything about you all as well. So, you know, life is long, careers are long. Hopefully we'll have the opportunity to cross paths in the future. So thank you. Next time we'll be in person, promise. I hope so. I hope so. Yes. Thank if you. If you're ever in Chicago. Thank yeah. you very, very much. Okay. Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.